is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Unspoiled, covering The Dark Tower, Book 7, The Dark Tower, Part 3, Chapters 3 and 4. New York again, Roland shows ID, and Fedek, two views. In these chapters, Roland gets to meet the family who kept an eye on everything and kept the rose safe, and he gets reunited with Susanna. Welcome to Unspoiled. I'm Miles. What's up, everyone? And um, I'm rather, I'm, I'm a little bit sedate today, forgive me, not feeling my uh, <laughs> usual chipper self, so I actually made an intro that was accurate. Um, so, yeah. Holy shit, they stayed on task. Who's sick? Uh, somebody is going to send a strongly worded letter that is in the opposite of all of the reviews I've ever gotten, which was, you know... I'd really appreciate it if you could actually tangent a little bit more. It right, bothers yeah. me that all you do is talk about the book and really, really kind of God, bored of it. Not here for it. Yep. Anyway, um, this is Dark Tower podcast, so you hopefully you're here for that. Yes. Um so yeah, these two chapters um okay. I have <laughs> I I have to admit not loving this. I really want to love it. Because I like that I I think it's just that we're so close to the end here that I'm wanting to like really get down to business and um when we're having these like asides, I know that they're crucial and I'm sure that the tools that they gave Roland are gonna wind up being a big deal. And finding out the behind the scenes on how they've been like tracking things and keeping an eye on it all is interesting in its way, but it's the kind of thing that I'd find interesting in retrospect after finishing the series. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's it's a weird kind of departure. It almost feels like an epilogue. Yeah. <clears throat> like, you know... I guess that's what the, I mean uh, about, like, I'd find it interesting if the series were over. Sure. It's kinda, like, kinda it feels, feels like, like an epilogue. It feels like the Harry Potter epilogue, right? Where it's mm-hmm. like, here's what happened, and... Here's where everybody is, or like one of those, um, like one of those things at the end of, of, of a movie where, it like, before the credits roll, it goes through all the characters. You know, so and so got a job with, right. you know, the industrial company, and now ba, lives with his mom or whatever. Ba, 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 yeah, ba, ba. yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it, I definitely see that it's kind of weird. I really like this first chapter simply because I enjoy the new characters that we're meeting a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and at one point there's a, there's a mention in this chapter that it's like these people and their fight against Sombra and North po- Central Positronics could be its own book. Right. And I'm like, I would read that book. Like I would read the shit out of that book. Yeah. You know what this feels like? A backdoor pilot. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. You know, like, it's just like they're introducing a bunch of stuff, and it's like, it's related, but you don't really need to know it, necessarily. And it will be really interesting and appealing to people who are, like, into this main thing. So we're just hoping to, like, pull you off to the side for this as well. But then that isn't what it is. Yeah, it's like, I'm over here trying to fucking get excited enough to finish Wind Through the Keyhole even though it's just a flashback. And I'm like, could we maybe have done this instead right. of Wind Through the Keyhole? Like, instead of a uh, something between books four and five, can I get, like, these two badass ladies and their weird godfather, like, <laughs> <laughs> fight, fucking fight and crime and shit? Like, I don't know. I'd be into it. Um, so I, I this chapter holds together really well for me, and I remember being 
enraptured with it in a way that I really hadn't been for most of the majority of this book. Okay. Because this part of the story interests me so much. Gotcha. And I like these characters. You know, I like the idea of, like, like he says, a new kind of gunslinger class arising in modern-day New York, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, There's a lot about it that I think is heavy-handed and, you know, for lack of a better word, king-esque. Um... But I really like the the chapter. The the next one, um, what Fedek Two Views is, yeah, is we'll get there. Okay. I have issues with that one more than I have issues with this longer one. Um. Yeah, and I I don't want to like. I'm not even saying it wasn't well done or anything like that. It's just not what I wanted right now. And I find that the more I do podcasting, I, I have, that's the thing that I get the most impatient with, is when writers, whether that be a book or TV show, decide to redirect a storyline into the forefront that isn't the thing that I'm actually here for. And um, it's shocking how often that happens. And I think sometimes it's like, almost a self-indulgence with the writers being like, well, I found this really fast, this concept fascinating. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if, but they're not thinking about whether that's interesting to the people consuming it. They're thinking about whether it would be interesting for them to like go off into this other uh, aspect of the story that they haven't visited yet. And mistakenly believe that that will also be interesting to the audience Sometimes that can pay off in a surprising way. I've been proven wrong a couple times where I've been like, what the fuck are they doing? And then, you know, after an episode or a couple chapters, I'm like, oh, actually, this is really compelling. But um, because this clearly seemed to only be for that chapter, and then there's a lot of, like, reference to the fact that Roland is never going to come back here again, mm-hmm. it, it kind of underscored for me that, I don't need to worry about this, which probably isn't true or fair about, like I said, I think the tools that they gave him are probably important. And some of what they told him is probably important, but being told like he's never coming back here over and over again, just kind of made me tune it out. And I feel bad about it because I don't want to be doing that. Um, So yeah, if you're like, you know, compelled by these characters and you're saying that you find it really interesting and i just didn't and uh maybe it's just That's because fine. i'm not feeling great today i don't know maybe it's um, i'm just in a bad mood and nothing's gonna get through that can happen it feels like um it feels weirdly like the house of the undying scene in the clash of kings to me how's that just like as part of Roland's journey, he kind of like it feel it, it feels like the um, or or I guess I guess I should be more accurate. It feels kind of like what the House of the Undying scene is deconstructing in the Clash of Kings. Okay, like you know the bit in that where she walks in through the doors, and uh, there's a bunch of like lords and ladies going like, "You have won through all the challenges, and now we have gifts for you." Right. You know, it kind of feels like. Like, that's not actually what's happening in Clash of Kings, but it kind of feels like that's what's happening here. And... Like, he just finished a side quest, and he's meeting up with the uh, head honcho to get given a bunch of yeah. stuff for the next one. Yeah. What what you're describing in terms of, like, a part of the, kind of a side piece of the story taking center stage briefly, I think it's something, it feels like something that used to happen a lot more in, like, old model television. When uh, seasons of TV were, you know, 20-some episodes long, and, like, every so often you would get, like, for no apparent reason, some weird, like, spotlight episode on one of the members of the cast. Okay. Or you'd, or you'd like, dig deeper into something that hadn't really been explored until then. Mm-hmm. Um, but with books, I think it's... You know, it's it's different. It works differently. And I think that it's just a matter of, like... Because I think what undercuts it is that... Like, again, I really like it. But if there's a thing that undercuts it, I think it's the fact that... 
the gifts, that, like, the things they give him are kind of meh. Right. So, like, it, and it's weirdly structured, right? So he goes in, he talks to them for a while, and then at one point he's like, all right, well, I'm going to go. And then they convince him to stay because they have gifts for him. Mm-hmm. But I'm wondering, like, I was kind of wondering why he was there in the first place. Because it doesn't really seem like he, uh, like, before they had, they said they had gifts for him, he had any reason to talk to them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of weird. And then the gifts themselves, well, I'm okay, I guess we should get to them. <laughs> we, we should get to the whole thing. I, what I'm trying to say is I think this kind of thing is really common in TV shows, which I think is why you might be more familiar with it. Um, but it might not work so well in books, even though I feel like it is pretty commonly used in like these adventure stories as well, this sort of thing. Right. I think that's, that that point is actually, and I hadn't really like put that, like pared it down there, but I think what you said about he comes and it, he like just talks to them and meets them and then is like, well, all right, got to go. And I was kind yeah. of like, well, then what is the point of this? Because I really thought he was going there for some crucial piece of information. I mean, he makes a, a huge side trip from Maine to get here. And it just didn't seem like all it seemed like he was doing was double checking that the rose was okay. Which I'm pretty sure he knew it was well, okay. I think he wanted to see it, right? Mm-hmm. And like the 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 lady does come up to him and be like, "Come talk to somebody." So it's not like he he might not have been going in there with any other intent other than I need to see the rose. I need to make sure the plan worked, right? Right. Um, and then they like kind of drag him up there and ramble for a while until his, until he's like, "Okay, if there's nothing else." I'm going to bail. Um, but it is weirdly structured, and I think that it could have been... I, I, I see what King is going for, and for me, the the personalities involved are um, compelling enough that it works, but mm-hmm. I don't think it would work for me without those personalities, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, so, we start off Chapter 3... With on the morning of Monday, the 21st of June in the year 99, the sun shone down on New York City just as if Jake Chambers did not lie dead in one world and Eddie Dean in another, as if Stephen King did not lie in a Lewiston Hospital's intensive care ward, drifting out into the light of consciousness only for brief intervals, as if Susanna Dean did not sit alone with her grief aboard a train racing on ancient chancy tracks across the dark wastes of Thunderclap, Toward the ghost town of Fedic. It's a long opening sentence. Mm hmm. Lots of semicolons. I was about to say that. Um, so, and uh, I wanted to mention that Jeremy Slagoth, who was the um, person on Twitter who was like feeling bummed that we didn't like the book more, mm-hmm. he um, DM'd me today and was like, oh yeah, it, the dude who ran over Stephen King was exactly like Brian. And he made sure that he never drove again. I think that was his name. So Krista was actually talking to me about this today in the Unspoiled Dark Tower spoiler chat with Miles. Um, Copyright. Let me know if you want in. Um, And she was saying some really interesting things, including that he apparently, the guy that hit King apparently like died mysteriously like a year later. What? I that's what that's what she said. Hold what? on, let me pull it up. Let me pull it up here. She was telling me about it earlier. I didn't have time to really talk to her about it unfortunately because I had to work, but um work. Get your priorities straight, buddy. Dude. What are you doing? <laughs> I know you can't afford to pay me. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um Let me see if she was. She had a lot to say. Krista did this morning, and I just wasn't like ready for it. Okay, because <laughs> I hadn't even had coffee yet. Um, Sir, yeah. So King knows. She said King knows the guy who hit him. That and what happened. 
There was an investigation. Smith got off light and then died from mysterious circumstances. And she includes a link with this. That uh, it's an article in ABC News from I can't find the year, but it says horror writer Stephen King expressed sympathy upon learning that the driver who hit him while he was walking near his summer home last year had died over the weekend. And wow. the guy, the guy's name was Brian Smith. He was forty three. No sign of violence or trauma. No evidence of trauma from the autopsy, but no conclusion was reached on the cause of death. Um, so yeah, that that was weird. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, it's uh, like uh, Roland went back. Yeah. And she also had a lot to say, Krista did, about, uh, about like how, you know, King probably felt bad because he got letters from a bunch of dying people that wanted to know the end of the story or whatever. Right. Um, which, you know, is is fine. I don't necessarily think that puts him under an obligation to write anything, but I understand if he felt bad about it and, like, if he was feeling thinking more about death, you know. So, wait. What? I'm not connecting why you're mentioning that now. Oh, just because that was the other thing she wrote. So... He, you're, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not following though. Like, why is she mentioning that he felt like he, she f- is saying that he wrote this really fast because there was pressure on him and that's why it's not a great book? I think she or... was responding to what I said last week about, you know, not really understanding why King seems to have felt so much guilt and pressure on himself to finish. Oh, with the, like, um, kind of soliloquy about, or it wasn't a soliloquy, it was just sort of him, like, you know, kicking his own ass about being super lazy and... Yeah, and, like, making an entire, a huge plot point of the book being this lazy-ass writer who didn't want to finish his work because he was too scared, you know? Right. Um, which I do, I do appreciate, one thing that I do appreciate in this chapter that we're talking about tonight, by the way... Is that we finally meet somebody who's like, yeah, Stephen King's not that great. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's like, yeah, he's not that good. I've read a bunch of his books. And, well, you've read a couple of them. So apparently he can't be that bad. And she's like, well, point. But he has I a mean, tin ear for language. Which look, I think is fair. I read the first five and a half of the Terry Goodkind Sword and Truth books. And those are garbage. <laughs> um... Yeah, there's, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I always just have to, like, kind of keep in mind whenever I start to feel bad about my work, any of my work, is that there are successful people who just don't do very good work. And they're still successful. So many. And it's fine. So many. I get very down on myself, but I I need to have the confidence of uh, somebody that's... I want to have the t- the confidence of like Tom Haverford from Parks and Rec, where you just want walk out and like introduce yourself as a mogul, even though right. you've got like your apartment and that's all you have. <laughs> um. Anyway, so anyway, we do start this with Susanna briefly, where she's on the train going to Fedic, and she knows that somebody has died, but she doesn't know who. Yeah. Um, so that's how this chapter starts. And then we go back to Roland and Irene. Um, and she's basically ter- taking him where he needs to go and kind of, you know, consistently jo- joking with him, being like, you sure you want to have sex some more before you leave? Just, yeah. just saying, if you want to, we can. I enjoyed that a lot. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> she's just like, I mean, I wouldn't say no. And in her yeah. head, she's going, I'd say yes. I'd say yes. I'd say yes really hard. I would definitely say yes to you if you want to do this. Um, but she's trying to maintain her dignity. And I love the way this little adventure of hers has, like, kind of affected her life and her relationship with her husband. Mm-hmm. Because apparently she gave him a call, and all we know is that in her own words, she seemed to have his attention again. Yeah. So, and she's like, that's great, like... It would be better if Roland stuck around and I could be with him, but that's not going to happen. So it's at least I, you know, get to kind of 
be a person in the eyes of my husband for a little while again. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, I just really like her. I think she's a really great character. Same. Um, but yeah, she, they go into the park, actually, when they get to New York. The same, like, bench where Susanna sat, which, of course, Roland knows is mm-hmm. where she sat with Mia, because that's how this works. They sit by the turtle, and, um... And Roland goes, leaves her there, and goes into uh, to Hammer Skull the Plaza. I want to say, um, which is basically, as it turns out, we've seen this building before, but we haven't gone inside it. Right. And it turns out it is the building owned by the Tet Corporation, which was built directly over the lot where the rose was growing, and it is just a gigantic shrine to the rose. Where uh, Tet works out of in New York, and where everybody just really likes hanging out. Yeah, I really, like, I can't emphasize enough how much I wish there was some place like this for real. That you could just go and feel better, and everybody felt better and so everybody got along better and especially it's some place that you work which is normally you're dreading going in but he's thinking about how people who work here wish they lived here yeah which can you imagine how great that would be if you loved your job <laughs> so much that you were like oh man i wish i could be here all the time i'm gonna work late tonight i'm gonna get that overtime and feel super happy about it like i feel like yeah that's the dream right right I yeah. just can't, I, I was reading it, like, feeling genuine jealousy of, like, these <laughs> fictional people. And also they live longer, so that helps, too. Yeah, exactly. And they and they get healed up from things and um, yeah. just generally enjoy a better life overall in every way. And he kind of talks about it as the opposite of, like, Fedic or wherever, like, Castle Discordia. Where people kind of, like, live shorter lives and get cancer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, again, all is twim. Listen, but, um, you're not going to live that long if you're eating people's pimple pus. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it can't be good for your system. <laughs> uh, uh, also, New York is officially Ludd, by the way. In case anyone was wondering. Mm. New York and Ludd twins. So... Um, but yeah, Roland goes in there, he sees the rose, it's in a garden, it's all very nice, there's a sign that says, uh, that he can't read at first, but, like, when this lady comes up to him, and, like, she comes up behind him, and he doesn't hear her, and then he tries to grab her, and she's not there. Yeah. And she's faster than him. Which is pretty great. Yeah. And this is the first of kind of the new gunslingers that he meets. This is Nancy Deep now, as it turns out. Aaron's mm-hmm. grand niece? Yes. Um, so she seems pretty chill, and she's like, you have to come upstairs, but first read the sign. And when he says, it's in your letters, I can't read it, she's like, don't worry. And it resolves into... Um, a memorial, basically. We find out later what it actually said. But it basically said, like, this is the rose donated by the Tech Corporation in memory of Edward Dean and Jake Chambers. So. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's go on. (laughs) All right. I guess Eddie's really dead. I mean, what do you think? I don't know. I still don't really I don't know why, but yeah, I just, I don't know. This is the part that's kind of got you thinking that he might be actually dead, though? Honestly, and and this is my perversity again. These are the parts that make me go, yeah, all right, sure, he's dead. (laughs) Even though I don't feel that way about Jake, whose name is also on the plaque, who we also had a big death scene with, like... There isn't a good reason for me to think Jake is dead and not think the same thing about Eddie, except for the way that Eddie's death was forecast. So you're 100% convinced Jake is dead? Yes. But you're like 75% convinced that Eddie's not? Correct. 
I would go so far as to say like ninety percent convinced that it's not. <laughs> all right, all right. That's very interesting. I think that um, you know we'll we'll get there, but that little last uh, bit at the end of the second chapter we're going over today with King from his perspective mm-hmm. um, has some really interesting things to say about Jake's death a- as a writer, um, which. <sighs> it's going to be frustrating for me because, like, there are things about that last chapter, that second chapter, that I can't talk about yet. Mm-hmm. Like, there are reasons I don't like them that I can't say anything about yet. So that's going to be a little bit frustrating, but I'll see what I can do. Okay. But, um, but yeah, so Nancy uh, takes Roland up to see the rest of them. And they kind of have a conversation where... Um, you know, I guess we should just, I don't, I don't know how to, like, again, I don't know how to, like, talk about this, because it's so weirdly structured. Mm-hmm. It is, uh, it, yeah. It just kind of, I think, my mind, okay, can I be honest with you? Yeah, do it. I fell asleep reading this. Ha! And I mean it. Like, not like, oh, my eyes closed and I had to, like, struggle to stay awake. No, I was asleep for, like, a couple minutes, I, I think. And, and there was, like, a weird dream, and then I came back out of it and was like, oh, shit. Oh, okay. This just didn't get my attention. And I wanted it to when I saw what we were doing and who we were meeting. I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But then nothing really, like you said, seemed to come of it until he's about to leave. And they're like, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. And then they just give him some, like... I don't know. Um, And they're explaining to him about how they have, like, their own versions of the breakers. Yeah. That are, like, precogs. There's a lot of weird exposition going into this, and it's almost like it was kind of necessary to give them people like this to explain why they would have certain things Mm -hmm. or know certain things. But it also makes sense to me because, like, if you're, you know, at this point, this corporation has been around for over... 20 years Mm -hmm. and they have made it their job to fight the crimson king in the keystone world so like they're gonna need psychics right and we find out there are a lot of weird connections here and, and and this is another instance where because i haven't read enough stephen king i don't know how much of this is supposed to be cool Easter eggs for people who have read other books. Okay. So, like, we'll talk about Insomnia, but I think there might be... I feel like there's other things in here Mm -hmm. that are kind of like, uh, God, like, there's a dude named Fred Town, I think, who, like, just the way he's brought up makes it feel to me like that's supposed to be an important person from, like, another book. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's just how it feels. Um, but yeah, again, it's like, there's so much here, like they have their own breakers, they do, they're doing their own things. They have, they have a whole division of people whose job it is to read Stephen King. (laughs) Yeah, that's really something. Um, I'm pretty sure that one of our listeners, Claire works for that group. Hey, like that's the, that's the only explanation I have for why she has read that much Stephen King. In the way that she has. <laughs> Hi, Claire. You rock. <laughs> but, um, it's just like, I don't know. There's so much world building going on here, and it happens in a second. And I want to know more. Like, this almost made me, I remember, see, you fell asleep during this chapter. When I first read this chapter, I was, like, more awake than I had been for the rest of the book. And when he leaves, I was like, aw. <laughs> like this this interested me. All right, that's fair. You know, all this like shit going on behind the scenes and I want to know who these people are and this lady uh what's her name? Marion? Marion Carver? Yes. Like she seems fucking awesome. Sure. And I don't know, her dad is fun. I can I I don't know how I feel about 
the whole thing with his dialect apparently being an affectation. Yeah, that was there was a weird moment there. It was it was I'm a, not going to get into that, but there was some talk of code switching in a way that wasn't a kind of uh wasn't a fan of the way that was phrased, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> well said. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. I like I find these people really interesting. I just like, you know, it's just weird that they don't have more to contribute to the story. So let's talk about what they actually do contribute. Okay. Is there anything first of all in this exposition dump that we're getting here that really stood out to you? Um really just like that they had these teams of people working on this thing. Mhm. Um and because it didn't occur to me that they would ever be able to convince other people that this shit was actually happening. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's a, quite a feat and also feels really dangerous to just be out there, like, <laughs> telling people all this stuff. You know I, mean, I mean, they seem to be a pretty powerful corporation. They said they're worth $10 billion or whatever. Yeah. So... <laughs> I get what you mean, but, um, I don't know. I definitely, I appreciated that certain things that I appreciated were like, I liked the line from Moses about how, you know, how certain people in country clubs would just be really mad to know that a billion dollar corporation was being run by a black lady. Mm -hmm. And I like that, I like that the next generation of gunslingers are both female. Like that makes me happy. Right. I think that, I don't know, like, Roland's interactions with them, especially with Nancy, like, when he, when, when, at, at, there's a great moment where Marion is like, Roland, your quest is done. Like, you've saved the beam. You've done what you set out to do. And Moses is like, fuck that shit. That was never, anything, that was never what he set out to do. Like, he didn't care about the beams. He just wanted the tower. Mm-hmm. And they're all like, Dad, just fucking be nice. And Roland's like, no, he's right. I, I don't, I could give a fuck. Yeah. I wanted the tower. And like, and uh, Nancy has what I would, what I would say to be the understandable reaction. Yeah, which is just basically, you fucking kidding me? Yeah. And, and he like shuts her down in a way that really made me kind of upset. I know. Like, it's almost written as if you're supposed to be like impressed with how much he like, frightened and intimidated her and i'm like uh she was right though yeah yeah so <laughs> you know congratulations on intimidating somebody who was the complete in the complete right here and that you know was in the right also like because he basically tries to be like well listen i just buried two of my friends and i'm like yeah because you cared about the tower more Right. Like, why are you acting like you get to be excused from what you did just because you sacrificed so much? You didn't sacrifice. You put them up for sacrifice. It's not the same thing. And it may feel like you sacrificed because you eventually actually grew attached to them. Right. But that was just a matter of circumstance. That has nothing to do with you actually, like, going into things with... Somebody that you loved already and being prepared to, like, do what you needed to do. It was an accident. You started to care about people that you knew were ultimately disposable to you. It's just totally circumstantial that by the time the the disposing part came around, you gave a shit. Yeah, and they so, knew it too. Yeah, and they also knew. And just because you realized retroactively that maybe your priorities were wrong... And that right. that was a shitty attitude doesn't suddenly make it, like, excusable or something that you have any right to defend and act like she's out of line. So just kind right. of get fucked, Roland. And I, I honestly think, you know, as we're talking it over and I'm thinking about it more and more, I'm wondering if this chapter wasn't meant to feel like an epilogue. Hmm. Because, like, she says your quest is over. Right. Like... The thing that you had to do, the saving the universe thing, has been done. 
so like you can and I think she says something like or somebody says something like you know this is the part where you go live your life because because you did it I mean I don't did anybody say that I thought that he says like normally giving you a watch would mean that but yeah, in this case, yeah. it's not really the same. Right, but the symbolism is still there, right? Because, like, they know that he's not going to give up. Like, especially Moses Carver says, this was never your quest. Your quest is the tower, and you still have to get there. Mm-hmm. Right? But, like, for a sensible person... <laughs> yeah. Like, the job's done. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if this was kind of meant to be a little bit like that. Especially since... You know, I referenced the Harry Potter epilogue earlier, and we know that King has read that. Yeah. Although, I'm sure that... God, when did the seventh book come out? Don't... I am no good with those dates on those books or anything. Like, it had to be, like, 2004, I think. 2003. Was it that early? Wow. I don't know. I don't, guess see? So. I told you. Don't ask me. Why am I even offering up any information? No, it was 07, so he definitely hadn't read... Wait. Yeah, he definitely hadn't read Rowling's epilogue yet. Um, but still, I think the point is is interesting. Um, so yeah, they have their own telepaths. Um, you know, we learned that Aaron Deepno is dead. He got, his cancer came back, but he got like way longer than he should have. Mm-hmm. John Cullum is dead. He got shot. Um, and Calvin Tower is dead of a heart attack. Um... But not before giving them the idea to get their own psychics. Which, oh boy. So the idea to get their own psychics, I think this is right. This is the most convoluted fucking thing. Go <laughs> ahead. I did not understand this. Let me let me see if I can do it here. So, the the book... The Hogan, which Cal Tower had the version of it where it was misprinted, the Dogen, was written by a guy named Ben Sleitman, who had written other books under the name of Daniel Holmes, which just happened to be the same name as Odetta's dad. And um, Holmes's books had lots of shit about telepaths in it. Am I am I right about that? Yeah. There was there's another thing later about fucking Ed Deepno, who's a character in Insomnia, um, but I think that that's something else. Um. So yeah, so Cal Tower, uh, I guess followed up on this dude Sleitman slash Hodges' other work and got the idea from science fiction to get other psychics, which like. I guess. I don't know why you need a that I don't know why you need that big of an explanation for See, it. This is and this is the kind of thing that I feel like just confuses the issue so much because King keeps like throwing these little like and this and this Aaron Deepno, same name, and this and this uh, same name as Odetta's father and I'm like, "Yeah, but so what? Who cares?" Like it all it, and and it's always handled when Roland hears this sort of thing. Roland was not surprised. Ka was a wheel. Right. Every fucking yeah. time. So who gives a shit? It doesn't right. matter. I just, yeah. I don't, I really, this is the kind of shit that I find, I waste brain power trying to connect dots that aren't even really there. He just throws some shit in there and is like, same as this other thing. How about that? <laughs> and it's like, well, you made up both things. You could make everything the same as any other thing, because it's all invented. So in, unless you have a real plot-driven reason why these things are connected, or something that actually, like, ties them back together in terms of motivation, I don't give a shit, guy. Like, and One he thing... keeps doing it. Yeah. One thing that I would be very interested in, if I could, like, get Stephen King in a room and, like, slip him some, uh, whatchamacallit, some, uh, Veritaserum. Rohypnol? Oh, Veritaserum, sure. <laughs> that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would ask him 
whether or not he really believes that, like, all of this just flowed from somewhere else. Or whether he sees himself as the ultimate author of this work. Because it's so weird to read, and again, like, I keep circling back to this part of the end with King, like, his own monologue, but... To read a book where the author is a character, and the character, who is the author, is talking about how he didn't write something because he chose to. He, it was out of his control. It seems like the kind of, like, tacky-ass fucking, like, platitude that you hear from writers all the time... You know, what's writing is like growing a garden, right? Or whatever. Um, and I want, I'm just really curious as to whether or not he really believes it. Because all of this, he's, he seems to be really obsessed with tying everything together for the sake of tying everything together. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's, it's, there are, there are, this chapter especially is like saturated with it. Like, there's reference in this chapter to Eddie saving Calvin from Balazar's guys. There's just, like, there's references to everything. And I just, you know, and, like, and there's they have a whole conversation about how ever since Stephen King wrote the line, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed... Everything he's done since then has kind of had a little bit of Dark Tower subconsciously going into it. Mm -hmm. And I just, I'm I'm really curious if I could, as to whether or not he actually believes that. And don't tell me you know, people out there. <laughs> don't tell me you know. I mean, somebody may have asked him the question. People may know. Yeah, but he, I, the, the... the likelihood of him telling a random person the truth about that kind of thing is extremely slim. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's like when you're saying and he he ties things together for the sake of tying them together, it's like he ties them together barely. <laughs> it's like the most half at like some stuff it really it feels legit here and there, but mostly it doesn't even feel like it's it just feels so retconned that I can't take it seriously and retconned for like no good reason other than to be like see how clever and it's just sort of just falls very flat for me I just don't feel like it's necessary I don't understand what he thinks he's he's bringing to the story other than the ka is a wheel concept which frankly we get it we don't need this over and over again <laughs> to know that um, I, f I feel like he thinks that, like, if everything's not connected, then the whole kind of concept falls apart. It's just, you know? it, it's just so, it, that's so missing the point, I feel like, of what he himself is trying to write. He's missing his own point. <laughs> and also kind of, like, weirdly not trusting his readers again. Yeah. Which he's, it, that seems to be the number one thing is that he just doesn't seem to trust that we get it and wants to hammer things home and, and he no longer has a hammer. Just let <laughs> it go. It's like, dude, the, the head came off that hammer a while ago. You're just like beating splinters into the yeah, wall. Yeah, your hands are bleeding. Go to the doctor. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about what they give him. Okay. Because they say... Um, we have gifts for you, Roland. Not enough to pay you back for all you've done, whether doing it was your first person or not, but things you may want all the same. One's news from our good mind folk in Taos. One's from more normal researchers, folks who work for us in this very building. They call themselves the Calvins, but not because of any religious bent. Perhaps the, it's a little homage to Mr. Tower, blah, 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 blah. And then there are two more from us, from Nancy and me and my dad, and one who's gone on. Will you sit a little longer? So he gets curious about um, what they have for him. So the first thing is... Wait, what is the first thing? They say they have information. Um, 
Oh, well, that information, isn't that the insomnia book? Oh, that he well, winds yeah. Up just giving away? Because he thinks it's suspicious? Yeah, okay. He thinks so it's a the, trick. The first thing they give him is uh, a book called Insomnia, written by Stephen King. Presumably because they feel like Roland's been having trouble sleeping at night. And they want to help him go to bed get and get, it? like, 12 hours of sleep. Because that book is so fucking boring. That's bait. Sorry. Yeah, it is. It's totally <laughs> bait. Um, that, that, was, that was for you, Krista. Um, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, so they give him insomnia. They're like, this is the closest thing that we have to a Keystone book. The Crimson King shows up in it. And they give him the story of insomnia, which is that uh, basically old guy dies trying to prevent... Um, wait, does he die? I'm pretty sure he dies. Um, old guy dies trying to prevent, like, proto-9-11. Right. Um, because the Crimson King, and there's a kid, too. Who... <laughs> oh, and there's a kid. Also, there's a kid. His name is Patrick Danville. And they're like, you should maybe try to find him for no reason. Um, but, because the book said he was dead, but he's actually totally alive. Right. And, well, they say he's like, he might be dead and might be alive, but, like, what's the point in even bringing it up if he's dead? <laughs> so. It's a valid question. Um, yeah, and the villain of the book is a guy named Ed Deepno, who was apparently a real person related to Nancy, but wasn't actually a, like, murderer. Right. Um... And, uh, yeah, this is when they have the whole conversation about how, like, King Subconscious was working on him. But, yeah, basically they give him insomnia, and they're like, have Susanna read this to you on the trail, because you might get some information out of it. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, like you said, right before he leaves, he's like, no, this feels thin. I don't even know what that means. And he gives it away. He says it feels like a trick, right? Yeah, it feels tricksy. He gives it away. Now, as I, I believe I've mentioned on the show before, I did not actually finish Insomnia. Um, because, uh, as, as previously established, it's really boring, guys. It's like, it's an insanely boring book. Um, so, you know, I'm sure that there are other people who have read it who could probably shed some insight as to what it is that makes this book tricksy, but I certainly don't know. And King, at this point, is not bothering to explain. No. Um, we do know that it's very significant that it has a red and white cover, because white is the color of uh, Arthur Eld, and red, of course, is the color of the Crimson King. Right. So, at least it's not white and black. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Small favors. Small favors. We shouldn't be worried. No need to, to take shots at the, the black folks. We really need to take shots at the Native Americans. I'm just kidding. Uh, um, uh, yeah. I so, you. I know. <laughs> so they give him insomnia. And then... It's so... Sorry, it's so weird. Because, like... They talk about how the book might be a false trail, but they don't think so. But he just doesn't listen. Like, no. I just, ugh, okay, you know what, I'm, anyway. I'm going to let it go in, and All hope right, that it, it means something, but I just, this is the kind of shit that makes me want to tear my hair out while I'm reading it. Right. I just, like, I have to come and meet these people and sit through this whole thing, and he's about to leave, apparently having gathered no information, and I'm like, why did we do this? And they finally stop him and give him something that he later just literally gives away, and not that much later either. And no, I'm just like sitting at here the like, end of the chapter. why? Okay. So, um, so yeah, they give him insomnia, and they're like, when you find Patrick Danville, he may still be the child described in the book, or he could be as old as Uncle Moe's. So that's that's good. Um, and then uh, they give him a box. This is the one that has the watch in it. Um, I do really like this moment for a second where he, like, gets really paranoid that these yeah. could all just be agents of the Crimson King and the box could be a, a snitch ready to explode. Yeah, same. I felt like, um, 
you know, I understand the way that this is written that we mostly can, like, he's got a sense and can tell when something is off and when it's not. So yeah. I wasn't, like, yelling at him, how do you know who these people are as he went in the way I might be if this book were written in any other way. But I do like the occasional return to paranoia here and there. Right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Mm. Especially now that, like, you know, they keep they keep saying there's no... There's no Cotet anymore, you know. They keep kind of... They're really reminding you in this chapter that Roland is very much a survivor and very used to being on his own. Yeah. So he's kind of, you know... Um, he's kind of... Uh, what's the word? Reverting, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they give him the watch and they say that it'll it'll keep perfect time until you start getting close to the Dark Tower, at which point it may stop. Right. Um, it was a sixteen thousand dollar watch. Yeah, because that's necessary. <laughs> well, he has to make sure it's not going to break for any other reason, right? Good God! Because because the cheap piece of shit. <laughs> He's like, we're Susanna. We're close to the tower, and she's like, no, I think you just got that thing at Walmart, dude. Oh God. Sixteen thousand dollars. My brother has two of these. What are you talking about? Um, and then the other, they tell him that they, he has to watch out for Mordred, and then they give him the cross back. Right. And that's that's it. Yeah. So and that's again, and, like, and like, there's a moment when they give him the cross back too, where it's like tears came to his eyes or his eyes widened or something. But, like, he just gave that cross away so recently that I really had a hard time believing that he would be so moved at seeing it again. Because I understand, in theory, it's been, like, 50 years. But to him, it's been, like, a week. <laughs> you know what I right? mean? Do you get what I mean? Yeah, that's, no, that's true. So it just, for me, that moment of him just being like, oh, my God, you have it? <sighs> I I just have a hard time believing that any of us, even with the benefit of, like, knowing what the circumstance really is, would in our gut be able to, like, have that kind of emotional reaction because it just isn't going to feel that way to us on our end. Um, You would have walked in going, like, yo, can I get my cross back? Right, a little bit. Oh, you lost it? Really? (laughs) Oh, okay. Guess I'm not lending you guys any shit again. <laughs> I guess it's just like I I feel like it should be more of like a Greek mythology type deal, you know, where it's like you read like I don't know, you read like Perseus, like Clash of the Titans, right? Clash of the Titans, they're like the gods have gifts for you. Mm-hmm. This one's a sword, and this one's a shield, and this one's a helmet, and this one's an owl, and they're all magic. You know, and yeah. they do different things, and they give you different powers, and it's all really cool. Mm-hmm. And these guys are like, so here's a book that you're going to give away. Mm-hmm. Here's a cross that used to belong to you anyway. And, like, here's, here's a clock some... that'll probably stop working. <laughs> yeah, here's a watch that's function is to stop working. <laughs> and, like, I, like, it's it's not even so much that it's, the the stuff doesn't seem that great to me as it is that, I feel like we spent a lot of time on this. That was a long chapter that I literally fell asleep during. And it doesn't feel like it was worth it to me. I just don't. And and I might be proven wrong later, but at the moment I'm just like, I don't really get. I'm hoping that something like comes of it, but the way that it's all being treated, it doesn't feel like it will. And I feel like I've spent a lot of this series going, well, I hope that matters later. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. I just... I I think it was necessary to resolve the whole John Pelham thing. You know, the whole, like, Tet Corporation thing. I don't... Okay. I mean, you don't, you don't, you didn't want some kind of resolution for that? I didn't need it. Yeah. It's like the fact that everything is still going is enough proof for me that that was taken care of. I just think it's cool. Okay. <laughs> like, 
I don't know. I just think it's cool. There's like a secret sect of warriors in this big old black building in New York. And I don't know. I, I, I dig it, but I recognize that it's not like, I recognize that I like it because of the kind of shit that I find cool Mm -hmm. as opposed to any given like particular skill in like writing and structuring the chapter. Because even if like, I'm saying that had to be resolved for me. Like I really wanted, I really wanted something like this where he goes to the building and they're like, yeah, dude, the rose is good. And, uh, John Cullum and Moses Carver and Aaron Deep now were all like good, like super best friends. And they were fucking, uh, like partners doing all the bad things and fighting Sombra and North Central Positronics. And, and it's all good, man. We did it. You know, like, I, I, I really like that that happened, but it didn't need to be this long unless there was something else going on with it. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that was going on with it turned out to be these lame-ass gifts. I just, like, I don't, I'm not even, I, I, I said, like, well, I just really didn't need it. And I, I feel like that's oversimplifying it. I, I just feel like more what I said earlier, which is that I didn't need it now. Now... I want him to go back to fucking Susanna. Jake just fucking died. Right. You know, Eddie just fucking died and he knows that she's out there alone and he's dicking around to go see a rose that we know is fine because the world is still spinning and everything is still moving forward. So why are you doing this, dude? You don't need to waste your time right that right now just to like make yourself feel better and get a little comfort by going to see this thing. And I would be much more interested in, oh, there's an army of warriors that are all working towards good and guarding the rose if it felt like this was ever going to come up again. But it's weird. It's weird because, like, why did he go to New York? This is my whole question right now. Didn't, like, somebody tell him to? Like, didn't Jake or something tell? Jake told Irene that she had to take him to New York. Did he? Yeah. So, it's like, he goes there for that reason. He doesn't really know what he's doing there or how to leave. Like, the weird thing about it for me is that they drop him off at the fucking Dixie Pig. Yeah. Which which I, I like. Like, I like that kind of callback. But, it's like... He would have had no idea how to do any of this, like, how to get out and get back again if he hadn't gone to that building. You know, it just feels so, just, like, convenient. Now, because they, I mean, they told him all about the Dixie Pig. So, are you saying, like, he wouldn't have known where to find it? I mean, and when I I say they, I mean, like, Jake and... Jake told him about the Dixie Pig after everything happened and whatnot. I mean, that's true. I guess he might have known that that was, like, the way back to his own world. But even when he goes to find it, he's like, I hope this door works. Yeah. You know, and we never get any inkling that um, this was any part of his plan. It feels like he's kind of walking in. It feels like going to New York is like a pilgrimage that he made because he didn't know what else to do because Jake was dead. Mm -hmm. And Jake told Irene to do this for him. And so he he makes the pilgrimage and as a result of making the pilgrimage he meets people who can just like send him on his way. Right. But it does feel a little bit hand wavy, you know? Um, Yeah, so. So there, there it is. All right. Let's go to him uh, meeting up again with Susanna. Yeah, she, she does have a weirdly touching uh, goodbye scene with um, with Irene. Mm-hmm. Oh, and by the way, Natasha, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, the slang term for BMW is a Beamer. It's a it's a Beamer. Like oh, beam. Oh God, like the beam. Like I the didn't beam. Even realize that was the connection that. That because he just like stopped and asked, and I thought that it was because it sounded like a weapon, kind of. <laughs> but damn, okay, uh, it's a beamer. 
Anyway. I didn't even get that. Oh, man. Yeah, so he and Oi... Um, oh, and we should also mention that uh, Roland ta- basically talks directly to Oi. Right. After leaving the uh, the other quartet, basically. Um, and Oi is like, yeah, Jake said Dandelo. Watch out for Dandelo. Because Eddie said watch out for Dandelo. Right. Um, so he does acquire that information. Uh, he gives, uh, I read the book, um, and, uh, they follow Jake sent back down through the Dixie Pig, um, and return to Fedic through the door that, um, that I think that Jake went through. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, so, and now we have Susanna, uh, in Fedic and Roland and Oi meet back up with her and they have a reunion. Um... Like I said, there's a lot of this that I'm not going to be able to talk about because the reasons that I have issues with it refer to later events in the book. Um, I will say that the fact that he, like, kisses her on the cheek and she turns his, like, his face so it's on her lips is weird Mm -hmm. to me. Is that weird to you? Yeah, it was like she was like, I'm going to let him know that it's no halfway thing. And I'm like, so what does that mean? That you're yeah. gonna fuck him now because you're so committed? Like, I don't understand. I, I just didn't really. I just. Anytime that King can make something uncomfortable, it seems like he does. I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, she says, let him understand it's no halfway thing. Let him understand that if I'm in it, I'm in to the end. God help me, I'm in with him to the end. Um, also, always super happy to see her, and it's really sweet. And she's super upset that Jake is dead, obviously. Um, and then, like, she tells Roland how Shimi died, which I don't even... Why? Like, what does this accomplish? Listen, I know, I feel like I'm a broken record, this book, but I keep feeling this way. Why? (laughs) I just don't get it. If you're gonna kill him, then have a reason for doing it, and have a... Can we at least get a fucking death seed, for God's sake? It just... I... I just... I was so fucking baffled that he dies off-screen, in, like, a really awful, gross, dragged-out kind of way, like, as an infection. That's a terrible way to die. And in reality, he probably wouldn't even have been dead yet. But... Yeah, he just dies off screen and they just leave him on the train. (laughs) They just leave him there. The guy who was Uh. the reason that they all got out in the first place. They couldn't be bothered to drag him out and bury him or anything? And, And Roland, like, doesn't care. No! Like, that's the other thing, is that he says... The only thing he says in response to learning that Shimi is dead... Is be like, all right, well, we're going to add his name to the list yep. of the names we're going to save when we climb the Dark Tower. And I'm like, that is, that is just a real fucking bummer of a way to get rid of this character who, like, his reappearance was one of the really cool things about this book. And his relationship with Roland and their reunion was one of the really cool things about this book. Mm-hmm. And, like, and, and just gone without anything. Like, I don't, I don't understand. There, like, and this is, I mean, that's why when I started this episode talking about these, I was just like, uh, like, there's just so much going on. I He just, he focuses on shit I just don't care about. And then the things I'm really invested in, like Shimi, he completely shits all over. I just don't get it. I frankly, I'm like baffled that this series has the fandom that it has. Because at this point, it doesn't feel like it deserves it at all. I'm just like, I'm falling harder and harder on the I don't like the Dark Tower series as, as we get to the end. The first three books were great. 
And after that, he really starts to just throw things at the wall and see what sticks. And the things that sticks, he's like, all right, so I won't do that. Yeah, I, I think I've said before that when I first, um, like when we first started doing this, that that what I had heard is that when we first started the podcast, I read the first four books. Mm-hmm. And my understanding from a few of my friends had been like the last three don't really live up to the quality of the first four. Mm-hmm. And like, I talked a lot of shit about Wizarding Glass because <laughs> Wizarding Glass is a really strange, often boring book. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's a coherent story. Yes. With like a narrative that makes sense and yes. character arcs and like, and shit doesn't happen for no fucking reason. There may be times where we spend a lot of time on stuff that is not really that necessary. But mostly, I still cared because he got me so invested in the characters and he didn't just start adding random shit. It was always, I'm going to spend extra time on this one character who you've already gotten to know a while. And so I'm like, well, I wasn't really looking for this, but all right, I'll go with it. And norm- and it mostly panned out. The only thing that I got sick of was how much he was fucking. There was a lot of him and, <laughs> and Susan Delgado fucking. And I started to get a little tired of that. <laughs> but otherwise, I was really pretty much down with that book, even though I can understand if people didn't like it, why they wouldn't. It feels very, very different from the first three. Yes. But, yeah, I mean, at this point, I'm ready to tear my hair out, and I don't know what he was thinking, and I don't know what his editor was thinking, like, and, and I'm calling out Jeremy Slagoff, not calling you out, like, to yell at you, but, you know, you were saying on Twitter that you felt bad because these books mean so much to you, and that the fact that we just haven't really liked them, and I I just, sorry, I really am sorry, because I hate to be somebody who is covering... A, a work that is close to people's hearts and doesn't like it. And I try so hard to be uh, like to distance myself from stuff and give it a chance. But we're getting to a point. I mean, what we're over halfway through the book now, right? Oh yeah. Like, yeah, we've got part four, part five. Yeah. We're like, we're, we're, we're basically at the, we're past the 500 page mark. We have about 300 pages left to go in my copy. I just, even if this series meant a lot to you, you can't like this book, can you? Do you? Why? And I'm asking that... everybody who's listening, who would be de- like in the position where they would defend this book. I am not. Tr- I'm not saying this to instigate anything. I'm genuinely asking. If you love this book, come at me and explain it to me. And maybe you won't be able to do that adequately until we're done because of spoilers, and that's fair. So wait until then. But Well, yeah. But, or let me know. I do have reasons, but it contains spoilers, so I will explain. And then we can have, like, you know, an episode maybe once we're done with the book where we go over things that people have written in about this. I think we definitely should. I, I, as I've said before... I'm very interested to know what you think about the final ending. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that just, because I, I just completely agree with you so much. Um, and like, okay. So we have a thing on smash fiction where for our patrons, we, um, every month our patrons get to vote on bonus content provided by one of our hosts. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a rotating uh, thing where it's like every month one of the hosts does something and then we go through a full cycle and then it's, you know, the next person's turn again, right? Mm-hmm. So, and everybody does their own thing. Like, Kit does art and Liz does music and Dan runs bonus episodes of Extraordinary League and all the stuff. My thing, for the past two times I've done it, has been talking about why I hate something that everyone else loves. Mm-hmm. Because that's you know, as as I'm sure everyone out there is aware, that's kind of my thing. Right. <laughs> but, like, honestly, I don't want to do that anymore. Like, and I've been thinking about this a lot, where it's like, God, it's really, like, it's not actually fun to shit on something that people love, guys. Yeah. 
it's not like it's not a thing that I do or that we do because because uh you know we just like get off on it and I and especially a series like this where it's like there is so much that history of like people who fell in love with the books back in the 80s and the 90s and like then he got hit and then they didn't know if they were ever going to get an ending and then finally they did and it was so great and look it covers all his other books and it links everything together and like to a certain kind of person who experienced the series in a certain kind of way I can absolutely see how this is like such an important thing in your life mm-hmm. and I really I really hate that we feel this way about it but like for my part as someone who read the first four books and then took a long break and then read the last three, I felt so let down. Yeah. And I felt so just like, what? what is this? Like, what are you doing? Because it just doesn't feel like the first four books. It, it just doesn't. It, and, you know, it doesn't, it, like, it doesn't have to. But you've got to have some kind of consistency in message or, or motivation or something. And it's just, it, it's just a bizarre disconnect with like, I, I just, I really can't explain it. And I can't come up with like a, a theory on where he was coming from on some of this because it's just so off the wall wrong that it it feels like I, I I can't the number of times that I have been lost for words over the way something has been handled is beyond belief to me at this point for a series that is so beloved that so many people wanted me to cover that has gotten the attention and is called his opus mm-hmm. I just can't believe what I'm reading at times that it, it, I don't understand how there wasn't a major backlash that led to this, this series basically being like kind of written off. Um, and I, I like I said, we aren't done. So maybe right. he'll, he'll bring it back, but there is precious little time left to do that. And I'm not convinced that there's going to be anything he can do that will Get me to forgive all of this stuff. I might be able to get back on board where I'm not just bitching every episode. But that is different than me actually feeling like he redeemed himself. Well, I think this is a good time to get into this last part of the chapter. Okay. Um, Because basically what happens is Roland and Susanna hang out for a while. They talk for a while. Um, Susanna doesn't know anything about Dandelo, and they basically find the passage that they're going to use, um, to get through to, where are they going? Uh, just, uh, oh, excuse me. Um, they say Discordia? Yeah, but they're going, like, underground? Yeah. Yeah, th- there's a passage that goes deep under the castle and comes out on the other side in the Discordia. Now, so I'm that's where they're going. by this. Why are they going there? Is that where they think the tower is? I have to assume so. Why do they think that? Um, (laughs) (laughs) Wow. All right, folks. There you have it. Guys. I swear the only explanation I can find is when she says, I don't look forward to going there again. And Roland says, but you believe we have to. Like, he, he, <laughs> you know? Oh, all right. So on that note. And, and like, there was something when they met, when they met, um, what was it that they told? They s- when he was in the meeting with those people that they saw Roland and the Red King locked at the top of the tower together. Oh, God, yeah. And he flips out and he's like, locked in there. I always assumed he was locked out on a balcony. 
<laughs> I can't even say that without laughing. That is such a weirdly specific thing to think. <laughs> <laughs> and to just be like, oh yeah, the tower's got balconies. Like, what? <laughs> Why? And it's presented as if it was something we should know. Right? It's like, Roland thought back on his own belief that the Crimson King was locked on a balcony. Oh, Roland, it's... I assume that the Crimson King has gone mad. Like, <laughs> there's just all kinds of shit that they just say. Only mad people go out on balconies. You know? Uh... Okay. So, like, so, are, like are, uh, we know that. <laughs> okay. Somebody help just, me out! I swear to God, it's please. the path of the beam, Natasha. The Somebody. path of the beam. Oh God! It's where they have to I'm drive the beam. I'm so mad. <laughs> okay, let's let's finish this up. Okay. Okay. Want to finish it up? Okay. Um, with this conversation about Stephen King. Uh, by the way, we now know that they are officially called subchapters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's that's happened. Um, it's an interesting little subchapter, uh-huh. but I think the thing that I most take away from this bit um, he thinks of Jake. He's sorry as hell that Jake died. And he guesses that when this last book is published, the readers are going to be just wild. And why not? Some of them have known Jake Chambers for 20 years, almost twice as long as the boy actually lived. Oh, they'll be wild, all right. And when he writes back and says, he's as sorry as they are, as surprised as they are, will they believe him? Not on your tin type, as his grandfather used to say. Uh... So it's almost like he's saying, I'm sorry for killing Jake. I didn't want to, but it had to happen. Right. And this is kind of what I keep coming back to. Does he actually think this? Because if he actually thinks this, then at the very least, there's a sort of meta honesty going on here. I think he does, at least... In the way that he explains, like, only bad stories get straight from point A to point B without any unexpected changes. Because that's something that I think everybody who studies media has come to see. Is that, like, contorting shit to fit your plot devices is a fool's errand and always results in shit seeming contrived and terrible. So things are going to come up and need to happen because of character development and whatever. And sometimes you just can't really get out of it. So in that sense, I think he is telling the truth. That I mean, I've had that happen writing my own stuff where I'm just like, sure. oh, I guess this is happening. And I did not go into it intending this, but I, there's really no way around it at all. And it turns out to be like a really crucial thing. I don't know do you, that that means that he thinks he's writing the fate of the world. No, no, no. And I would never think that he did. But it, it it's it's just like the difference between, like, is he, apo- is he apologizing for killing off Jake? Or is he, like, trying to hide behind an excuse for killing off Jake? I don't even think I, it's either one. I think he's just kind of, like, sharing his thought process on how, hmm. you know... I I intended for him to be at the end of the book. Right, he says that. Yeah. And just he be says like, he intended for all of them to be. Yeah. And just be like, and you know what? Sometimes shit doesn't work out that way. Which I think is actually kind of fascinating. It is Um Yeah, I can't I can't. Gotta wait till we read more. Okay. Um because I have I have more things to say. About this, but gotta wait till we read more. Uh, but it is a really interesting chapter um, where he kind of like briefly remembers the encounter with Roland, um, and uh, and that's how this chapter and that's how this part ends. Unless there's anything else you want to, to call out from it, I enjoyed the misery reference personally. Um, yeah, I need to read that. Have you seen the movie? No. God, it's so good. <laughs> it's one of the best Stephen King adaptations. Um, but no, I can't really think of, like, 
Yeah, I I can't think of anything else. I feel like I tore it to shreds about as much as I was gonna. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Well, that's the end of part three, actually. And uh, so next week we will start on part four, the White Lands of Empathica. Um, Dandelo. And I think we're gonna um, keep doing two chapters at a time throughout part four. Two chapters. Okay. Let's 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 try to get through this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a shame. I mean, if I thought that we had too much content for two chapters, like if I thought that each of these chapters had too much content for us to do in an episode, I wouldn't do it. You know. That's fair. And, like, if you at any point feel like I'm skipping through these too fast, I'm like, stop me. But I feel like I've had decent judgment about it so far. Yeah, I mean, like, honestly, I was reading these and, like, you know, you said the second chapter out of these two was shorter. And it was still pretty long. But I've been a little startled at how long they have been. And yet there's not that much to talk about. There really isn't. I mean, it's like that last chapter, like, Roland and Susanna talk for a while. Mm -hmm. Like, and they, they talk for a while. Yeah. But they don't say that much. Or at least they don't not say why. things that I want to know about. <laughs> you, so you think we need to go through Discordia? Oh, okay. I'm glad we talked that over. Like, what are you even doing? And now we left Shimi's dead body on the train. Well, that makes sense. Like, the stuff that I want them to care about, they just seem... Whatever. All right. All right. Well... Sorry, guys. Yeah. We're doing our best. I feel... I really do feel bad. Like, I, I don't know. like I feel being bad too. this guy. But... And, like, you were saying about, like, shitting on things that people love. I've never enjoyed that because, you know, when people do that to me with something that I love, it's awful. So, yeah, it I don't want to be that guy. But I, I'm... Right now... I'm just kind of like holding my hands out like, guys, give me something. Give me an explanation as to why you love this. Because if I were in an actual conversation with somebody who enjoyed these books or kind of like grew up with them, I feel like this would go so differently. But of course, that also would rely on being able to talk about spoilers. So I guess what it is, is I don't like ranting about it alone when the people who do like it aren't really able to defend themselves. Right. You know? And it's the kind of thing where it's like, yeah, it's also, you know, neither of us are like kingophiles mm -hmm. exactly. You know what I mean? So it's kind of a shame. I don't know. I feel like on the one hand it's kind of a shame, but on the other hand I really do feel strongly that like if I have to be that familiar with his entire backlog to enjoy this book, then fuck this book. Same. Like, I'm not, that that should not be a requirement. I mean, and if it is, at least provide, like, footnotes or something. Right, sure. Give me uh, give me something instead of just leaving me completely out in the cold, which is what it feels I, like is happening. I, yeah, and I mean, like, there, I, I know there is, like, a Dark Tower concordance, which is, like, an encyclopedia of this thing. Like, that exists. Right. Um, and that's fine but like when you have a series and you build a concordance or you build a world book after the series is, is finished or in the case of George R. R. Martin before um, then you that shit should be extra mm -hmm. you know like it should help it should give you a deeper sense of the story it should maybe have some easter eggs for like really devoted readers it should be like it shouldn't be required to understand what's happening or why so, yeah, we, I, you know, it, it, it ultimately might come down to the fact that we're not, you know, like the target audience for these books was the diehards, you know? And if you're not a diehard, you're just not going to like it. I don't know. Maybe that's true. I mean, yeah, I don't really know what to say to that then, if that's true. So, I don't know. I mean, I, I have no idea, but... um. You know we're gonna we're gonna try to be as kind to it as possible while still recognizing that it's not a very good book, guys. Yeah, this is a mess. Um, but I want to say hi to new patrons. So let's do that. That's a cheerful yeah. thing. Yay! So today, this week actually, we have David Waters, Roma, Sigstrata, 
Chrissy Whitney, Andrea Harper, Stephen Shacknies, M. Miller, Gooley, Issa Manshot, and Gallifrey Sparrow. All became patrons this past week. So welcome to all of you guys. Thank you all so, so much. What's up, guys? I think uh, if it's the same David Waters, and he's a big Smash Fiction fan. So uh, Oh, nice. Welcome, yeah. David. Uh, yeah, I think he just joined the patrons group today also, because um, I think he submitted a thing, and it asks, are you a patron? And he said, yep, just joined today. So I think that was him. Nice. Um, so yeah, welcome to that group also, um, in which I just posted how mad I am about this book. <laughs> so, Wait, did you really? I did. Um, oh, I gotta look at this now. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to uh, let you all know that I'm, I'm taking some um, ideas, but I think I've got an, I, an idea vaguely in place. So, Miles may, I think you mentioned on the show a little while back. The thing with um, how people were trying to replace hamburger buns with avocado halves. <laughs> yeah. And how I just, like, went off on it. And rightly so. And then I, in the patrons group, did a live video of me just screaming about it. And in it a monologue glorious. that yes. I don't think I took a single breath for the whole six minutes of that video. <laughs> well... I've decided that I'm going to start doing little 15-minute blurbs of me talking about food okay. with a different co-host every time and have that be like a little bonus thing for $5 patrons because I get real passionate about food. I have a lot of opinions on it, and there are so many things that people do wrong. There's plenty to talk about, and there are going to be times where my co-host doesn't agree with me. And I will yell at them. And I think that's fun to listen to, is me yelling at people, right? It's probably. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah. So that's a little thing. But if you guys have, like, an idea for, like, a 15-minute little blurb show that you think would be really fun, I'm still open to hearing suggestions. I'm not totally married to this idea. But food is, like, a particular thing for me that I know a lot about, I'm really, really good at, and I get very angry about. When it's not done well. Because it's not hard to do it well. And that's the part that makes me the most angry. Mm. It's not difficult. It's just that people don't even make an effort to, like, look up how. And uh, so, yeah, I, I'm i interested to hear if you all have suggestions for 15-minute small bites uh, bonus content for $5 patrons. Because I don't have the time to fit in a whole other podcast right now for five dollars and up so currently the only patrons only show that's going on is for a dollar and up for everybody and that's the harry potter podcast so i've been trying to figure out a way that i can still give five dollar patrons a reward without it being a whole like hour worth of tv watching two hours worth of recording hour of editing because i just can't fit that into the schedule that i have right now i'm hoping to pretty sh pretty shortly but at the moment can't so yeah send me on your ideas guys um unspoiledpodcast.com or unspoiledpodcast at gmail.com facebook.com slash unspoiled pod you can message me or tweet at me and um yeah that's about it so take it away miles oh, all right y'all can find me and everything i do over at www.mjschneiderman.com that's m-j-s-c-h-n-e-i-d-e-r-m-a-n.com <laughs> and uh, that shit includes uh, some Smash Fiction shit, which is fun, especially because we just dropped the Roland episode. Whoop, whoop. It is online. It is Roland DeShane versus Vash the Stampede, who is a uh, super crazy good gunslinger from the anime at Trigon. If you're familiar with that, if you're not, you know, one of the cool things about Smash Fiction is that you still get pretty familiarized with the characters even if you don't know them over the course of the show so um yeah i th think i said that's a show where um we put fictional characters in contests and see who would win but that's what we do and that's what we did this past sunday when we dropped roland versus vash and of course yours truly is uh defending team roland in that particular battle so if you want to know how that turned out go over to smash fiction uh, and the Smash Fiction feed is on Libsyn, it's on iTunes, it's wherever you get your podcasts. You can go to smashfictionpodcast.com, it's our website. 
you can go to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Podcast. My bonus content, as I mentioned, is coming up again soon, and I'm doing something a little bit different for it this time, so stay tuned for that. Um, patrons of our show uh, at $5 and up get to vote on the nature of the bonus content, so um, if you want to be able to do that, you also get to suggest new episodes for us to do, new matches for us to do. You get to vote on all kinds of stuff that we do on a monthly basis, so... Um, yeah, go check out uh, patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Check out smashfictionpodcast.com, and we are all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, etc. Um, also, be sure to check out the Odyssey Storytelling Podcast, which um, the new episode of that just came out on Monday because I was a few days late editing it. Um, so that's my bad. We were at Comic-Con this past weekend. Um, but... Yeah, so that show is really fun. It's basically the podcast version of a live event that takes place once a month here in Tucson where I live um, with people telling 10-minute stories based on a theme from their lives. Uh, So we do every month the full live show from that month goes out on the podcast feed, and in the weeks in between we do individual stories from earlier in Odyssey's history. So uh, this past episode was actually the full show for uh, May, and the theme of this show was fake. And it is a really, really excellent show, you guys. Like, I love a lot of what Odyssey does, um, and this show stood out to me as just a particularly good program. Uh, the story in particular about the fake orgasms are uh, is uh, is probably the single best story on the on the lineup. Um, but everything from the fake show is great. It's online right now um, on the Odyssey Storytelling Podcast, which is again on iTunes or wherever you get them. And for more information on that show, you can go to odysseystorytelling.com. Um, and finally, you know, if you feel like reading shit that I wrote in September, go over to uh, universesofthemind.com, which is my um, not quite yet totally defunct sci-fi blog. <laughs> um, and by December, I mean, or by September, I mean September of 2017, incidentally. Uh, so, you know, we're coming up on the anniversary of me not having written anything. So that's just, that's fantastic. Now, what is the anyway. anniversary? Is it paper? Because that would be ironic. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> TV. Lord. Um, anyway, I think that's about all I have to uh, to plug for now. You have a lot going on though, there, Mister. I do. Um. All right. Well, everybody. Oh, I should say one more thing. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. One more thing. Uh, the first episode of the second season of Geek Wars is officially online. So if you search for the Geek Wars podcast and um, you subscribe to that, um, the first episode, which I believe they are still uh, 10 episode seasons. I'm not sure about that. Uh, it could be more. But um, I'm not on this one, but myself and Claire Mulcairin, my fellow host on Smash Fiction, were contestants on Geek Wars this season, so we will be showing up soon. So uh, check out the Geek Wars podcast, because we uh, go on there to try and prove our, our geek knowledge, and um, the the first episode that we're on might prove of, uh, of particular amusement and interest to people who have been following me for a while. <laughs> so. All right. Um, yeah, see? You've got a lot going on. I do. It's all right if you haven't written in a while, I guess. I know. I'm, Seems I'm like writing you're for, still doing stuff. It's because right now I'm writing for actual money instead of for the opposite of that. Yeah, I think that's understandable. <laughs> and, like, yeah, it's, like, crappy corporate writing that I don't plug because, like, it's not a thing that I am doing, really. But it's a job, so, yeah. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I'm sorry we were a downer. I hope you can forgive us, but we still love you. And we hope that we see you next week. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.
Unspoiled Network Podcast.